All right, so I know you guys heard that, you know, one of my degrees came from the University of Alabama, and I want to make sure you guys understand that I am truly rooted in the state of Louisiana. So my house is not divided, and I bleed purple and gold. So let me get a go, Tigers. I'm honored to be able to be here and stand in front of you today and hopefully be able to plant a little seed, a little seed of hope because sometimes that's all you need. So they told you all those great accolades and all the awards and the, the, you know, all these things that I've done and how successful I am. But I want you guys to understand, I sat in the same seat that you did. And actually, I may have been worse off than some of you. So at nine years old, my dad buys me a telescope and I decided right then I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to know what was out in the world, in the universe, besides me. I had my big brother and we would scale the antenna on side of the house. How many of you actually know what those antennas look like? Some of you do? Okay. <laughs> well, we would scale that antenna at night. You put your feet on the wall and you go up and we'd go up at night. My brother wasn't a big universe person, but he went with me because he knew that if something happened to me, he would also be in trouble because he was my protector. So he would go, he would sit, and then he'd say, you know, we probably need to get back in the house. They're gonna lock our window. At 13, my parents divorced. And I went from taking vacations during the summer to not knowing if I was gonna have water or food in my refrigerator. You see, my mom made just enough money not to qualify for food stamps, but she didn't make enough money to truly take care of us. So she would call home sometimes and she would say, you need to draw the water in the tub and fill the buckets because they're gonna cut the water off today and it's gonna be two more days before they turn it back on. It was such a normal routine for us. I didn't know anything was wrong with that until I told a story one day and I was in an all-white environment when I told the story. And all of their faces, let me tell you something, guys. Y'all can't hide nothing because you turn red, right? <laughs> so I was sitting there, and I watched all these people turn red. Not him. He's, he's not moved by this. But I watched them turn red, right? And I realized right then I stopped my speech. And I said, oh, my God, your faces just gave it away. What happened? And one of the guys says, I've never had that happen to me, and I don't know anyone who did? I said, you know what? Now you do. And guess what? We still survive. It's that little bit of hope. See, my mom didn't care what was happening at home. She made sure we made it to school. Even when we were homeless. We lived in a car because my father was abusive at one point. And we were in the car. She made sure we got to the gas station to be able to clean up because we were going to school. And you went to school and you did what you needed to do. She took us to the library afterwards to make sure we got our homework done, and that was the routine. I tell you guys that part of my story simply because I didn't die. I'm here. I decided I'm gonna get out of high school because I didn't like it. There were a bunch of bullies. I was really smart. I was five foot two and the biggest geek that anybody had ever met. People would say, can you do my test? I sure can, pay me 20 bucks and I'll do it. Right? And I was good at that. My daughter's in college and she's not doing so good with college algebra. She just texted me and said, can I pay you to take my test? Oh. No. Flunk it again if you need to. But the point is, I really wasn't good at high school because I didn't know that social stuff very well. And I was messing that up all the time, the social stuff, right? And at 5'2", bullies like picking up on you. I've been beat up twice. Maybe three times. I think the last time, though, I got some licks in, so I might have done okay. You know, just never know. But I graduated at 16, and at 17, I went in to the Air Force ROTC. See, I still had that dream of wanting to know what was in outer space. So even with everything else that had happened, it didn't kill my dream. I went in, they tested my hearing, and for the first time in my life, I found out that I was hearing impaired, and I didn't know where it had come from. But what I do know is, I watched the Air Force recruiter, the physician, 
mark a big red X next to reject on my paperwork. And I told him, what does that mean? He says, it means you can't be in the Air Force as an officer. He says, actually, you can't be in the Air Force. I didn't really know what to do after that, though. See, I had only dreamed of being an astronaut, and I had understood that there was one path to get there for me. I was going to go to college, major in engineering, become a pilot, from there apply to be an astronaut, and then boom, how could they tell me no? I was going to be an astronaut. That day I left, and all my dreams had been washed away. I cried from Mississippi all the way back to Baton Rouge. I was heartbroken, and I didn't really know what else to do. Ladies, my boyfriend played football. He was on the offensive line. He was real fine. <laughs> he had muscles and stuff popping. <laughs> yeah, he was tall, dark, and handsome. We got pregnant. Yeah, see? Mm -hmm. We got pregnant. He consoled me. I was happy to be consoled. Five months later, I found out I was carrying a baby boy. At that time, my father said, you're pregnant, you get married. We got married. I didn't even like him that much. Well, besides the fact he was real fine, though, you know, let me take that back. But we weren't aligned the same way. We didn't have the same dreams. We didn't have the same foundations. We didn't want the same things. None of that worked. But I dropped out of college, became a mother, followed his career. He was not that smart. We didn't have a whole lot to even talk about. We were good at making babies. And we made another one. So now I've got two boys. The marriage doesn't work. I come back to Louisiana. I have my daughter. And now they bring me this beautiful baby girl with a head full of hair. And she's looking at me. And she says, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I just had a baby, so I'm going to take a rest. And you just got here, maybe you should take a rest. And if my mother was in the room, she will tell you I was full of drugs, and that conversation did not happen. But when I look at my daughter, I realized then that I needed to change my life to be able to make sure she would be able to have the life she wanted. The catch is I had the boys, but I was growing up with them. I was 17 and 19 when I had the boys. So they were like my buddies. I could say stupid stuff like, we should go build a slime castle. And they'd be like, yes, I'm down. <laughs> my daughter came. I ain't want no more slime castles, right? I knew what the slime was going to do. By that time, I was a real adult when my daughter was born. I decided we're going to go back to school. So I took my three kids. We moved into LSU's campus into the family housing, and I made exactly $9,000 a year, and I raised three kids off of that. We received food stamps and Medicaid, and I went to school each and every day, and I got an electrical engineering degree with two kids, three kids. Oops, don't tell them I said that. <laughs> I wonder who I just got rid of mentally. <laughs> with three kids. My daughter was under two. She was, hadn't even turned two when I went back to school. So I graduated. One of the beautiful things is you guys go through a ring ceremony, right? LSU does the same thing. When I ordered my ring, I put each one of my kids' initials on the inside of the ring, along with my full name. Because, see, they had just made a sacrifice, and they believed in me probably more than anybody else. The catch is they didn't realize just how poor we were. I used to take my change when I came in, and we'd put it in a jar. And during the summer, we'd take that jar, cash it in, and depending on how much of money I was able to save up over the year, that depended on where we'd go on vacation. Because, see, I'd have to have enough gas, right, to get us there and get us back. And then whatever we needed to do. We'd take vacation. They didn't even know you took vacation where you didn't have the food in the hotel room. Because I'd pull up a cooler and put everything in there. They were on vacation. So when their friends would say, what did you do this summer? We went to, and they'd name the places. Nobody ever talked about if they ate at a restaurant. Well, I sat down, and I didn't have a job, and I decided, hey, we're just going to go ahead and get a PhD, too. And the kids were really excited, right? See, the boys, they're smart, but really not that smart. <laughs> they said, we're going to be a doctor. 
And I said, yes, love, we're going to all be a doctor. <laughs> they really think my money is theirs now, too, unfortunately. <laughs> we went on to the University of Alabama. We only chose the University of Alabama because it was driving distance from home, from Louisiana for us. See, I had to be able to move all four of us at one time. So that is the reason I chose, because I could drive that distance. It was about four and a half hours. I could drive that distance. And so we went on to the University of Alabama, and doing that, I found out I was going to be the first African American to receive my degree in this material science and physics, and I thought it was an amazing thing, and it was not. I had the weight of the entire black community on my shoulders. So when I failed my qualifiers, everybody knew it. The cleaning lady, the janitor, is the one who told me I failed. I came in and she said, oh, baby, I'm sorry. I said, what? She said, you failed. And she said it so matter-of-factly, right? She says, I'm just sorry. She says, but I promise you, you'll do better. And I was thinking, how she knew? She said, don't worry about it, baby, we all know. See, I realized right then, that my dreams and that little seed of hope was not really just mine. And I tell you guys that because each one of you have a dream. And if you haven't started dreaming yet, it's okay. When those dreams start coming, it'll be rolling like a film for you to decide what it is you want to do. But see, your hope is not just your hope. It's your friend sitting next to you's hope because on the day that you or wishing that things were okay, or really happy that they were okay, somebody else is feeding off of that as well. So halfway through my PhD, I was dealing with a whole lot of adversity, a lot of racism, a lot of sexism, just a whole lot of things. And I remember I had decided to quit. And I was gonna pack it up and come back to Louisiana. And I went home, and my oldest, who is now 29, about to turn 30, I said to him at the time, I'm done. We're done. We're just going to go ahead and start looking for a job at the end of the semester, and we're going to go on. And he said, wait a minute. We're a doctor? And I said, no, 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 you're not listening. I'm done. He said, no, 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 are we a doctor? Because you told us we were going to be a doctor. I said, that's not exactly what I said. I said, I was going to be a doctor. Y'all was along for the ride. <laughs> but I get it. He said, no, 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 no. I'm still trying to understand. He says, are you a doctor yet? And I said, no. He says, then you're a liar. Damn. Yeah. So being a black mama, right, I read up, right? I'm like, did you really just call me a liar? Like, what's wrong with you, boy? And he was like, no, let me tell you. You told us we were coming here to do something. And now you're telling me we not. He says, you said to me a long time ago, when somebody's not telling the truth, they're a liar. Right then I understood, if nothing else, I did not want to be a liar to my son or to the other two. I kind of like the oldest one. <laughs> so... I went back on Monday, I went back on Tuesday, I went back on Wednesday. It was probably the proudest moment for him when I walked across the stage. Because see, it was his little seed of hope that he was willing to hand me that day I wanted to quit, and I didn't. Well, wanting to be an astronaut means you work for NASA. Well, my life came full circle at some point because that's where I am now. I've only had two major jobs in my life. One was a rope company that I got fired from, and two months later, NASA. And I've been at NASA ever since, living out my dream. I may not be able to go to space, but I was truly blessed to have my very first project be a project where they allowed you to put your name on the vehicle. Well, you know, I went in there. So who else's name went on the vehicle? Any guesses? Your kids. My kids. My mama, my daddy, my sister, the boy I was dating, the boy, grown man I was dating. Now, ladies, 
Right here, I, I do want to interject. There's a note to that story. Don't put nobody's name on nothing that's going to burn up. Right? I didn't think that one through because, you know, as his name came back into the atmosphere and disintegrated, so did our relationship. <laughs> I should have been a little bit smarter about that one, but I wasn't. Today I am working on the largest rocket that will go the furthest we've ever gone and it's the most powerful thing NASA has ever done. It's bigger than Elon's rocket. And I am excited because my dream may have been deferred, but it was not extinguished. I make sure you understand where I came from. I'm from Baton Rouge, from South Baton Rouge is where my family came from. I went to McKinley High School. We didn't have uniforms, and I didn't wear a name brand, but it didn't kill me. I was able to still achieve and get the things that I have today. I'm still not pretty big on name brands. I do like my good shoes, though. Go so figure that. I want you to understand that regardless of what your situation is today, it does not dictate who you are or where you're going to be tomorrow. Because see, each time you lay down your head and you wake up the next day, whatever happened, you can't really change unless you get pregnant. And then that's a nine-month one, right? So stay away from that. Other than that, the other stuff doesn't matter. I promise you. If it did not kill you, you will survive. Thank you.